Now, have you ever been riding in a bike lane like this with cars flying by on one side and parked cars on the other side where they could take off at any moment or fling a door right into you? If you said yes to this, then you know the increased level of stress in the space. It's at this point between two cars that you realize this place sucks and I want to be as far from this on a bike as possible. So why do cities all around North America and other places continue to build streets like this? I honestly think many who design and plan these facilities have good intentions, but this design fails to convince most people to use a bike for mobility. In today's video, I'll focus on an example of how to better use the space we have in our streets to make biking more safe and comfortable. I will focus on one typical street configuration I see in many places and present the bad, better, and best biking options that can be accommodated in the same space. In this video, I'll also show a city that's done well to improve and call out the many cities that still utilize bad bike lane options. I thought about the idea of a better use of space because when I was a kid, my mom made me and my brothers rearrange our living room no less than five times, not joking, to try and achieve the optimal feng shui. For one option, she even had us put the TV in the middle of the room with cords hanging out and everything. I'm pretty sure it killed feng shui at our house. There was something to it though, and the use of space could really make a room feel better and more enjoyable to be in. I never understood true feng shui, but I use the concept of rearranging the living room and apply it to optimize the space in our streets. Here's a SketchUp model I put together showing the typical use of space for streets I see built in many cities. I'm going to attempt to give the bike lanes here a new name, Exposed Bike Lanes. I'll explain in a minute. Today I'm going to focus on this example which is typically called a minor collector street in the US with two travel lanes, on-street parking, and bike lanes. I'll look at other street types in future videos, but this type of street commonly gets built through neighborhood areas and provides a good starting place for improvements in your town. These streets are built with highway characteristics that result in higher vehicle speeds. Here are some issues with this design. First, the parked cars right next to the bike lane put a door zone that extends into the bike lane space. It can be dangerous to those riding if a door flings open and causes someone riding to crash. In fact, dooring has been deadly more than you would think, including several that I read about in Montreal, New York, in London to name a few. There's no wonder people feel uncomfortable to use these, which leads to suboptimal use of the space. Second, the bike lane space acts as a wide shoulder that creates a large shy distance for cars driving that encourages speeding. I'll cover this in a future video, but people generally drive a road based on how it feels. Shy distance is the shoulder space clear of any poles, cars, or any other objects that a high-speed car may hit and cause severe injury or death to a driver. Wide shoulders are absolutely needed on a high-speed highway, but in this case, a neighborhood street absolutely does not need to support high-speed traffic, and instead we want to slow down traffic speeds through proper design. The door zone combined with the shy distance for cars leaves a thin tightrope for someone riding a bike to stay out of the way of the two-ton rolling steel cages. Third, these bike lanes create longer street crossings for pedestrians, which is problematic for anyone walking when combined with higher average vehicle speeds. It is even worse for our youth, older generations, and those with disabilities as they may have differing cognitive judgment, have a slower walking pace, or may have hearing or vision impairment. Fourth, if it wasn't bad enough already, cars parking or living have to cut across the bike lane space to access or leave the travel lanes of the street. This invades the tightrope of space a person was left with to cycle in these bike lanes. When you ride on this type of bike lane, you're exposed to two-ton death machines from all angles, and this is why I call them exposed bike lanes. It is human nature not to want to be exposed from all angles, no matter the situation or threat. Let me ask you, how does a facility like this provide confidence to the average person that they will be safe, let alone even be comfortable while riding in that space? Realistically, most people just drive if they own a car or ride on the sidewalk if they don't own or can't drive a car. This perceived safety issue also correlates with an actual safety issue as shown in a 2012 study completed by the University University of British Columbia, which found that emergency room visits from bike crashes in Toronto and Vancouver, Canada were almost twice as prevalent with exposed bike lanes than with protected bike lanes. I know based on all these issues, exposed bike lanes are just like the TV in the middle of my childhood living room. My mom would be telling me right now to rearrange this space. So let's do just that and rework this space and go from exposed to vehicle protected bike lanes. After a little mix and match, we end up with a retrofitted two-way vehicle protected bike lane, which is a different and more optimal way of using the same space that provides some benefits. This street still has travel lanes, parking lanes, and bike lanes, but placed in a new configuration that moves the vulnerable users away from threats of traffic. This option can help with traffic calming and creating a more comfortable and safe space to ride a bike in. Here are some of the benefits of this change. First, the parked cars provide greater separation from moving traffic and physical protection if a car veers off the road. Second, the door zones for the parked cars extend into the newly created buffer area for the two-way bike lanes and a little into the travel lanes of the road. People biking can stay out of the way of car doors and people coming and going into their cars can 
and steer clear of bike traffic. Third, the side distance and clear space for the travel lanes is removed and the travel lanes are also narrowed. This provides a traffic calming effect and helps keep vehicle speeds down closer to the posted speed limit. People driving are going to be averse to getting too close to parked cars as well as to traffic going the opposite direction. This makes drivers pay more attention and can result in slower average speeds. Fourth, this option reduces the pedestrian crossing distance between parked cars on the street and results in people spending less time in car space. Fifth, Cars parking and pulling out don't have to cross the bike lanes to get in and out of traffic. Drivers are focused on traffic and don't need to additionally pay attention to someone on a bike. Finally, for places with snowy climates like here in Utah, snow plowing can be fairly easy to accomplish with the two-way facility as a truck and plow can be driven down the wide bike lane area. The buffer area can also provide some snow storage space. More specialized snow removal equipment and methods could be used as a town increases its bike infrastructure network. There are some considerations for these vehicle protected bike lanes that do need to be considered. First, the buffer between the park cars and bike lane space is critical to reduce the risk of people getting doored. On some two-way bike lanes in Montreal, for example, some have more buffer and some don't have any buffering at all. Second, visibility is critical at conflict points so cars turning in and out of streets and driveways can see those riding bikes. Parked vehicles, especially large trucks and SUVs, can limit visibility. Parking can be limited at conflict points to maintain better visibility, such as in the street view of Prospect Park West in New York. Third, if only paint or reflector poles are used for the buffer area, people are going to feel like they are parking their cars in the middle of the street at first, and cars could potentially get into and park in the bike lane space, even if it is just for a quick stop. Curb stops, planters, or concrete protection will make the facility feel more protected and feel more permanent. Slowing cars before they turn is key and can be done with a smaller turn radius or narrower access point. This retrofit option is exactly what we are working on implementing in the city I work for. I have to shout out to our engineering department as they've been really supportive and worked closely with us planners to implement this new design. This wide street and one other one will soon incorporate parking protected bike lanes and will benefit those who are already riding and encourage more to ride. Often when advocating for change, you must take baby steps. Going from the exposed bike lanes to the retrofit two-way vehicle protected bike lanes is a first good step. There are great opportunities when completely rebuilding a street or constructing a new street. The same amount of space can be used to move the bike lanes completely off the street into a two-way option or a one-way option. In this case, the planter strip areas can be used as a buffer space and trees can be planted to provide even more protection from traffic. Building it right also provides opportunities for continuous sidewalks and bike paths at local streets and accesses, bending the bike path for optimal visibility at conflicts along higher speed roads, and creating safe protected intersections. The option to build a street right from the start could potentially save money as part of the space for use by cars is smaller. The separated bike path areas require smaller substructure than for vehicle traffic, which can save with over excavation and less use of sub base. So why wouldn't we want to build streets that have the more potential to slow cars down, be safer, more equitable, and cost less? In reality, change for better infrastructure typically requires baby steps so that residents, city staff, and leadership can become more familiar and accepting of the changes. Over time, the infrastructure can be built to be more permanent just has been done in the Netherlands. In the Mueller District Development and other places in Austin, Texas, they are doing just that. In this image, you can see they had exposed bike lanes just as I had in the model. A few years later, they changed them into parking protected bike lanes using striping and reflector poles, just as we are planning in my town. Now, their latest phase built them separated with a landscape strip with their initial construction. One of their intersections also started as an unprotected intersection with longer street crossings and got rebuilt with protection, shorter street crossings, and a more clear sense of priority. I'm now going to take this time to call out some cities that currently have exposed bike lanes that could retrofit their streets with parking protected bike lanes. I could go on and on, but I wanted to call some out and start creating some accountability for cities to do better. Many cities are trying to do better, but there's always room for improvement, including my town. If you want to advocate for better streets in your town, take this concept to your city leadership and see what willingness they have to consider these options. Don't make my mom come get the feng shui of your town streets in order, because she will. I hope this video was helpful, and thanks again for joining me on this bike quest.